I'm your host, Aaron Heath. I'd like to take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 64 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 064. Now, we had a pretty good response to the carry tip instead of a gun of the show last episode, so we're going to do it again. And this episode's carry tip will be carry a backup gun. Now, if you live in Texas, then you probably understand why one would want to have a spare tire. If you're like me, then you have never driven a vehicle that has that did not have a spare tire. Carrying a backup gun is akin to keeping a spare tire in your vehicle. It's simply a matter of being prepared. Some folks will say that the chance you will need a firearm is remote and that the chance your firearm will fail when you need it requiring you to need a backup is far more remote. And even if that was the case, and keeping that in mind, a backup gun is more than a reserve weapon for the potential failure of your primary weapon. It is also a reserve weapon that you can use to arm someone else if you need to. There are more potential uses for a backup weapon than that, but in the end, it all boils down to training and preparation. In closing, keep in mind, Firearms are simply machines, and machines really do fail. The saying that one is none and two is one applies to firearms more than we would like to admit. And let's face it, the Boy Scouts' motto of be prepared is a goal that we should all strive for if we carry a firearm. If you go to a class that a firearms class that teaches you the need or the uh, has the best way to put this. If you go to a firearms class that teaches you the need or the capability that a backup gun gives you, you will never carry a firearm without a backup gun. It's just a simple matter of being prepared. As a hunter, I more often than not will carry a rifle for what I intend to hunt as well as a handgun just in case the rifle fails and I'm having to deal with a dangerous animal that may or may not be wounded, may or may not be trying to kill me, and so on. It's all a matter of being prepared. Now let's say you fire your rifle and something goes horribly wrong. The, uh, the bullet leaves the barrel, not as a bullet, but more as a, a field of debris. Now, this obviously takes your rifle out of commission because maybe there's part of a jacket still in the uh, bore. Or maybe the case swelled up and you can't work the bolt if it's a bolt action. And you strike your animal, wounding it. And now... You can't get close enough to the animal because if it's a deer or a hog, even wounded, it's still dangerous, even if it can't get up and get to its feet. Well, you have, as a hunter, you have an obligation to put that animal down humanely. If the only firearm you have is your rifle, you can't do that simply because your rifle is no longer serviceable. That's where a backup gun comes in, and it's critical that you have that backup gun if you're a hunter. Now, your self-defense, your license carry, uh, license, your license to carry a firearm, and you're going about your business, and suddenly you find yourself surrounded, and these people that are uh in that have surrounded you one of them grabs your waist and finds your concealed handgun and before you can get that concealed handgun into play you're staring down the barrel of their not so concealed handgun that's in their hand and his buddy is relieving you of yours This is where a backup gun comes in to be real handy. You may not get out of this alive because you're dealing with at least two armed attackers, maybe more. 
But then again, you're in a situation, bullets are flying, you fire your primary weapon, it doesn't cycle. Tap rack, you try to fire again, it doesn't function. Maybe the magazine's bad. You swap magazines. You go through your malfunction drill. You try to fire. It still doesn't fire. There is a mechanical problem with the gun. Maybe the firing pin broke. Maybe the sear isn't actually releasing the hammer. Who knows? But your firearm is not working. This is a good time to have a backup gun. Let's say you and a friend that you haven't seen in four or five years are out and about checking out the old haunts. He's talking about uh, his life as a pastor and how he likes to shoot his firearms collection, but he doesn't believe that someone should carry a firearm for self-defense because, well, maybe it's a tenant in the church that he goes to that you should depend on God for self-defense. A lot of us don't believe that, but some do. We have a community here that they're strong supporters of that. Now suddenly you're in a situation where you have to defend yourself and your friend. And you hear your friend that's a pastor telling the Lord that if he gets out of this situation, he shall start carrying a firearm. You have a backup gun. You hand it off to your pastor friend, and you get out of there alive maybe. Maybe you don't. It all depends. But your training, these are all scenarios that could easily happen, and it all boils down to training. Now, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hit the audio that tells you how to get the show because I'm starting to ramble a little bit. Then we'll come back and we'll do some listener feedback and show announcements. But first, here you go. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Now, due to work, I'm still going through the backlog of voicemail and updating the headers on the social media accounts. I still haven't got to do, around to doing all of it, but I think I'm, I'm down to about half of the voicemail. And I'm not going through it in any particular pattern. I'm just going through it in the w order that I can, that it looks good. Anyhow, I would like to address someone who has emailed me several times calling themselves Christopher James Galloway. Now, he does this in email messages. They come from an address with the username don't let God sort them. And the name J.L. Alonzo can be found in the signature that is attached to the email. This guy, he's not all there. And that's my not so professional opinion. However, I want to address him, and I'm going to do that right now. So, Mr. Don't Let God Sort Them, do you really think telling me your name is one thing while the signature in your email says another makes you some sort of elite hacker? Or is it the fact that you are threatening the seriously flawed Intel processor in my quote-unquote Apple system, and the seriously flawed Intel processor is a direct quote from his emails, But anyways, he's threatening the seriously flawed 
Intel processor in my Apple system that I use only for video, and this is his quote, video and audio process, only for video and audio processing, end of quote. Does this somehow make you think you're an elite hacker? Now I want to give you a quick correction. I think I may have one Apple product to my name, and that is an old, I think it's a third gen iPod that I have not seen in years. And because I have not seen it in years, I may have thrown it away. But it truly amuses me that you feel I am somehow responsible for all the gun rights advances and that you think you can single-handedly, as you put it, revoke, and that's your word, the Second Amendment and put all gun owners in front of firing squads for tweet, blah, for treason, tweeting, good lord, I was going to say tweeting. His exact words were, put all gun owners in front of firing squads for t treason. Yeah, I'm a little bit tongue-tied. I'm running on about an hour's sleep, so. Anyhow, I'm going to give Mr. Don't Let God Sort Them some advice. Grow up, get alive. And try to actually learn something valid since you claim to be, and I'm going to quote this because you can't really make this stuff up unless you have a mental condition. And this is what he says he is. He claims he is a, quote, 10th level supergraduate student in an exclusive and elite mega university that only allows Mensa members to enroll, end of quote. Anyhow. Mr. Don't Let God Sort Them. I'm just going to say, move along and go embarrass yourself somewhere else. I have ignored this guy's emails for quite a while. The first time I responded to him, got a reply. Second time, it was more of the same drivel. I, yeah, I'm not going to get any kind of response from him, so I sent a boilerplate reply. And about the fourth or fifth time, I sent him a reply saying I wasn't replying to him anymore, even with the boilerplate. However, this guy is getting more and more unhinged, and I thought, well, I think it's time to kind of address him on the podcast. Maybe that's what he wants, and if I do that, and I embarrass him enough, maybe he'll go away. If not, well, I can always add him to the spam filter. Anyhow, here's the audio clip that tells you how to find the show on social media. And after that's done, we're going to come back with our topic. And our topic is real gun safety. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook, you can follow it on Twitter, you can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. Everybody has issues with what someone else says is gun safety. Let's face it. All your gun control groups are branding themselves gun safety advocates or gun safety groups. Gun rights folks are, well, we're kind of big on gun safety and we have a different definition than uh, banning guns as gun safety. And I want to talk about what gun rights advocates really view as gun safety. There are four rules. The NRA can kind of combines them into three, but the standard is that there's four rules. Rule number one is all guns are always loaded. And what this means is anytime you see a firearm, you treat that firearm as if it's loaded. It doesn't matter if it is or if it isn't. As far as you're concerned, that weapon is loaded and it's treated as such. Rule number two is Never let the muzzle cover anything you are not willing to destroy. Keep in mind, rule number one, that all guns are always loaded. 
if you don't want to destroy something, you don't point a loaded gun at it. And that's where rule number two comes in. Rule number three is keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on the target. Essentially, if you don't want the gun to fire, don't touch that trigger. A good quality modern firearm will not fire unless you press the trigger. I don't care if it's a Glock. I don't care if it's a 1911. I don't care if it's an m and I don't care if it's a high point. Well, high point's not a quality weapon, but that's beside the point. Oh my God, I just messed up. I'm going to have high point uh, fanboys emailing me. But anyhow, if you got a good quality modern firearm and you don't want it to fire, you don't touch the trigger. You, you can touch the trigger with your finger, with a poorly made holster. And more often than not, it's the act of touching the trigger that makes the firearm go off. So keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on the target. And that way you don't hit anything unless it's your target. And rule number four is be sure of your target and what is beyond it. I like to add in, make sure you know what's between you and your target too. You have to be sure that your target is what you think it is. You cannot go shoot a target and then discover there's something else that it's taped to that you really didn't want to shoot. You don't want to shoot a target that doesn't have a backstop and that bullet travel on down and hit a car going down the highway a quarter mile away. And the reason, the reason I say you also want to know what's between you and your target is imagine you have a concrete slab between you and your target. And this concrete slab has an edge, a 90 degree edge that as you're firing over this concrete slab, maybe your sights are wrong. And this uh, concrete slab that's three feet below where you fire, below the bench, combined with the sights being low and a extremely low power or powder charge in that cartridge results in the bullet coming down, striking that piece of concrete and causing the bullet to ricochet back at you. It may not kill you and it may, it may just wound you. It may miss you, but you have to know what's between you and your target as well as what's beyond your target. And you have to make sure you're certain of your target. If you break any of those rules, you're risking a negligent discharge that could injure or destroy something you don't want injured or destroyed. And I want to give you an additional safety tip. And this is the knife rule. The knife rule is never try to catch a drop knife, and in the case of firearms, or a drop firearm. I had a negligent discharge thanks to following or not following that knife rule. Very long, complicated story, and, well, I really don't feel like sharing it, but you don't try to catch a firearm that's falling. Trust that it's a quality firearm and that all the safeties will come into play and keep it from firing. You know, some folks may say, oh, that's pretty good. Uh, that's pretty good start for an episode. To actually, or a good start for a topic on an episode, start out with the four rules and the knife rule. But you know what? We don't stop there. We want to talk about at the range. And we're going to talk about range commands. And then we'll wrap this episode up. Or we'll talk about what you do at the range, basically. There's range commands. There's things you do to make sure you're safe when you get there. And there's also a range condition and warnings that are issued verbally. And we're going to talk about all three of those. When you get to the range, you check each weapon that you're going to be firing for bore obstructions. You also keep the muzzle pointed down range and between the berms if there's berms present on the side. You always, 
and I do mean always keep the muzzle below the backstop. You always wear ear and eye protection. And for the love of God, obey the range safety officer. They know what they're doing, and they issue these commands, and they issue instructions, and they basically tell you how to be there and be safe. So obey the range safety officer at all times. A lot of rangers don't have them. They are just kind of show up and shoot. In that case, anybody that's there acts as a range safety officer. In fact, anybody that issues any kind of range command, obey that command. It's always a good idea. If somebody says cease fire, you stop shooting. It doesn't matter if it's a range safety officer the owner of the range, or just a four-year-old kid that's sitting there shooting his first twenty-two, and his scope flew off, and he wants to go retrieve it. If somebody yells, cease fire, you cease fire. And you always, and I do mean always, obey all range commands. It doesn't matter who issues them, you obey them. So let's talk about range commands. I've already mentioned cease fire. When the ceasefire command is issued, you stop shooting. When it's called, it should be called three times. It should be stop shoot, or it should be cease fire, cease fire, cease fire. Why do you repeat it three times? Well, somebody may not hear it the first and second time. If you yell it at the top of your lungs three times, everyone around you should hear it. Anyone, it doesn't matter if they're the range safety officer, a four year old kid shooting his first 22, or an 85 year old war veteran who's out there firing his M1 Garand. Anyone can issue this range command. Now, there's another range command. This is usually issued by the range safety officer, or it may be a uh, issued by whoever's uh, in charge of the firing line because sometimes range safety officer is not the only person that's in charge of the firing line. You may have an instructor, and he may issue these commands too. Unload and show clear is essentially the next command that you need to be aware of. When this command is issued, you drop the magazine, you lock the action back where it's open, if there's a cartridge that's in the chamber, make sure it's ejected. If you have a revolver, make sure all brass is ejected, whether it's uh, a live cartridge or empty brass. And then you call it good. Now, the next command varies with ranges. Some will say step to the firing line. A lot of ranges I have shot at actually say step forward. And when this command is issued, you now have permission to move to the firing line. You have from the time the step to the firing line or step forward command is issued until the load and make ready command to actually step to the firing line. If the load and make ready command is issued, you don't go any, you no longer move to the firing line. Well, let's talk about the load and make ready command. When the load and make ready command is issued, you insert a magazine or you close the cylinder, the bolt, and then you engage any kind of safety mechanism on your firearm, assuming your firearm has one. If you have a clock, well, you really don't have to do that. At this point, the range safety officer or whoever's in charge of the firing line will then ask if the shooter or shooters are ready. And the RSO, range safety officer, needs to know if everyone's ready. If you are not ready, shout no. If he gets no response, he's going to assume yes. But it's always a good idea just to straight up 
when shooter's ready is issued, say yes unless range rules say otherwise. You don't shout yes, you just say yes. Now the next command you have to be concerned about is commence fire. This is issued after a range safety officer has given any instructions they have. At this point, you can start shooting. You, if there are instructions that relate to how you're going to conduct the string of fire, you follow those instructions. If the range has certain rules about how you start firing, you follow those rules. If it's a free-for-all type deal, enjoy. And those are your basic range commands, but it doesn't end there. You see? There's range conditions and warnings as, what, as well. And range conditions are also warnings as to the state of the range. Let's just face it. Face it. For example, range is hot. When this is, it, when this is uh, said aloud, that means the range is unsafe for you to go down range. People are able to shoot, permissions given to fire, and if you cross that firing line, there's a very good chance you're going to get perforated. Range is cold. Range is cold is almost always stated after unload and make clear. At this point, there should be nobody firing. The weapons are pointed down range, actions open where it can be seen. And if you need to go work your target, this is a good time to do it. The next warning, and that's what it is, it's not a condition, it's a warning. Is muzzle. When you hear muzzle, that means someone, probably you, has violated rules regarding muzzle discipline. This command is often followed by the, uh, the identification of the shooter responsible. If it's you and your last name is on your jacket or somehow you're identified to the range operator, they're going to identify you when you break the muzzle rule or when you break muzzle discipline. And you, a lot of ranges will give you one warning and then the second time, it's usually pack your stuff up and leave, or at least the ranges I've been to. The muzzle warning is not taken lightly. It's kind of a, you get one mistake on this, and that's it. A few ranges I've been to use a breakage condition or a breakage warning. This is usually issued after a ceasefire command. And it means that something broke and you need to look around for parts. You do not move. You do not kick. You do not step on them. You wait for the other range commands, such as unload and show clear, before you start moving around. But if you hear breakage, it's usually... Cease fire, cease fire, cease fire, breakage. And what you'll do is you'll look around. If you see something, you take note of where it's at. And then you'll hear unload and show clear. You unload your weapon, you show, lock the action back, show it's clear, place it on the bench or the rest. And uh, then you point out where the part is. Now, another one I have heard, and I've only heard this one at one range. Of course, I've only had the opportunity to hear it at one range. It was something like this. Cease fire, cease fire, cease fire, injury. Now, the injury warning is usually issued after someone has been hurt. And it's usually issued after a cease fire command. We had a rifle I think it was it was a 22 rifle because this was at an indoor range 
He was about two lanes down from me. He fired. And something went wrong. I don't know if he didn't have the bolt completely closed and he just had an old beat up wore out rifle. But when it fired, the bolt came back open and he got sprayed in the face. Thankfully he had eye and ear protection, but he got sprayed in the face with hot gases and things that normally you don't have coming out of a bolt action rifle. And I heard cease fire, cease fire, cease fire injury. I turn around. I cleared my weapon, set it down, turn around, trying to figure out what's going on. And his shooting partner was with him and he picked up a first aid kit they carried with him. And that's always a good idea. Carry a first aid kit when you go shooting or hunting. And they started cleaning the wounds and figured out, oh, it's just hot gases in his face. Maybe a little bit of burning powder. Looked like he may have had a few new blackheads on his face, but other than that, you know, this young 20 something year old kid was unharmed. But the purposes of a breakage or injury command is so that whatever's going on, you're aware something out of the ordinary has happened. I have heard the breakage command a few times or breakage warning a few times. Most ranges don't have a rule for it. Some do. It seems to be kind of popular out here near the New Mexico state line here in Texas. Or at least on the private ranges that I have shot on. And I'll, I'll admit, I don't shoot on a lot of commercial private ranges. These are usually private ranges that are owned by somebody for either instruction purposes or this is just my private range and I'm going to let you shoot on it type deals. But that's really what we're seeing here. Anyhow, I want to run the audio clip that tells you how to get in contact with me and then we'll come back. We'll hit the news. It's going to be our typical three news items. And after that, I'll sign off and give you our scenario for the show. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Well, for Gun Rights in Texas News, we have three articles. Our first one's in defense of self and others. Weatherford, Texas police shot a man who pulled a knife on paramedics that were trying to help him. Now, the man was treated at the scene for the gunshot wound and transported to the hospital where he was rushed into surgery. He was later pronounced dead and Texas Rangers are investigating this officer-involved shooting. Keep in mind, if you pull a knife on somebody and they have friends with guns, you're likely to get shot. Now, uh, the article tends to make people think that maybe this guy was sitting there showing signs of a mental issue. But when you get right down to it, if you have to shoot somebody that's got mental issues in order to save somebody else that they're going to try to hurt, it may not be that bad of a thing. It all comes down to, do you value the life of someone that's known to you more than you value the life of someone that's unknown to you that may just simply be a crazed killer? We're going to move on to politics, and we have two stories here. First off is more hysterics about open carry from the media. And you can find that in the Houston Chronicle with an article titled, With Open Carry, Businesses Will Have to Choose Sides. The article explains how concealed carry can be prohibited with specific signage under Texas Penal Code Section 
and open carry will soon be banned using signage that complies with Texas Penal Code 30.07. The thing about it is, the article is basically lamenting the fact that, well, the guns are visible and com complaints will come in and the business will have to choose either to ban guns and upset gun owners or not ban guns and upset the customers that are upset by seeing guns. The truth of the matter is, the reason there are two signs is so that a business can ban open carry and still allow concealed carry. Or the business, if they don't want concealed carry, can ban concealed carry while allowing open carry. And that's really what it all boils down to. Now we also have a story where a small church in southeast Texas is prepared should someone decide to attempt an attempt or to attempt an attack, let me get my tongue untied, on it like the one in Charleston, South Carolina. The pastor is armed along with a good number of the congregation. And the article has a cute little video to go with it where the pastor is explaining things and he shows where his weapon is in his pulpit. In his pulpit and, well, it's a, it's a good, it's a good article for, for showing that, hey, Churches do have a right to allow people to carry in their congregations. And I strongly recommend that anyone that goes to a church carry a gun if it's not prohibited. Churches are considered soft targets by a lot of deranged types. And soft targets are often uh, considered ideal targets. Now with that said, I want to run the audio clip that signs the show off. If you want to stick around after that, we'll have a scenario for this episode. It's going to be based off something that was recently in the news. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. You're in a commercial location waiting to be checked out while carrying a concealed weapon. While you're waiting, you notice a man carrying a shotgun come in and he starts to load the shotgun followed by him working the action, chambering a round of ammunition. This scenario is based on a recent uh, article about where some folks that opened carrying a shotgun went into a Walmart, bought 12 gauge shells, loaded their gun and chambered around. But you may not know that they just bought that ammunition. You may not know that they're loading that weapon for self-defense. In fact, you probably don't know that. If you see somebody loading a firearm and then chambering around in public, what do you do? How do you react? What do you think is the appropriate response? If you can't answer those questions, then maybe you need to seek out some training. Maybe, just maybe, if you can't answer those questions, you still need to seek out training. The idea of these scenarios is to get you to think about different scenarios and different ideas on how you might want to avoid becoming a target. This is not normal behavior. The appropriate response to this is to raise your alert level, maybe move to concealment if you don't have cover available, and if cover is av available, move to cover. Keep in mind, check stands are typically made out of particle board, and particle board typically does not stop bullets.
Now, with that said, you don't really want to draw down and start shooting on this individual because it may just be some idiot trying to earn his cool kids card with his local open carry association. Or it could be some idiot trying to get ready to rob the store. So you need to be on a higher alert level. But the ideal response, in my opinion, well, I can't tell you that because this is intended to make you think about your response. Now, with that said, please stay safe and carry responsibly.